very much. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this marvelous location. And I will start with some very recent data from Germany, from the German Health Report. According to this report, we have about 7.5 million people with diabetes in Germany currently. More than 95% suffer from type 2 diabetes. And there is an estimated number of about 2 million additional undiagnosed cases of diabetes. So this is about more than one-tenth of the population of Germany that is affected by diabetes. And they produce costs, for example, for therapy, 16 billion euros per year. And this corresponds to about 10% of the total healthcare costs. So, and as it is anticipated that the numbers, the prevalence numbers and the costs will rise in the years to come, there's an urgent need of cost-effective use of anti-diabetic medication. And pharmacogenetics wants to contribute to the reduction of these costs by contributing to patient stratification, by stratifying patients according to their genotype, and uh, by contribution to precision medicine. And the aim of pharmacogenetics is to identify or to characterize the impact of genetic variation on treatment response. Especially, we want to identify genetically determined non-response and genetically determined adverse, adverse response to a drug. And we also want to study the impact of genetic variation on side effects. This is the arsenal of anti-diabetic drugs here. I think you all know these drugs and, and their targets. I do not have to go into detail here. I will uh, shed some light on uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists and DPP-4 inhibitors and on SGLT2 inhibitors and also, of course, on metformin in my talk. What are the genes we are investigating? These are, on the one hand, the genes affecting the pharmacogenesis kinetics of a drug, so uh, the genes that are involved in absorption and distribution, metabolism and excretion of a drug. These are mainly transport proteins and the ens uh, hepatic enzymes of biotransformation, cytochrome P450 enzymes and so on. But we also study uh, genes involved in the pharmacodynamics of a genes. These are the direct targets of the drug and their subsequent signaling pathways, if there are signaling pathways. For example, metformin, the molecular target of metformin is the complex one in the mitochondrial electron transport chain, and uh, downstream targets are AMPK, adenylate cyclase, fructose bisphosphatase, and um, so on. I will start with metformin, pharmacogenetics of metformin. And metformin, uh, the target of metformin is the mitochondrial complex 1, NADH dehydrogenase. And uh, inhibition of this complex leads to an increase in AMP concentrations in the cell. And this has several effects. On the one hand, AMP activates AMP kinase, and AMP kinase inhibits several uh, biosynthetic pathways. On the other hand, AMP is an allosteric inhibitor of fructose bisphosphatase, uh, inhibiting this gluconeogenic pathway in the liver. On the other hand, it inhibits adenylate cyclase. This leads to a drop in intracellular cyclic AMP to an inhibition of protein kinase A and uh, reduced gluconeogenic gene expression, also contributing to a persistent inhibition of hepatic glucose production. And here you can see the treatment response to metformin uh, in the Godard study from the UK. And as you can see here, most people uh, show a very good treatment response here to metformin. But however, there also seems uh, to be a subpopulation of people that do not respond to metformin or even show an adverse response. They increase their HbA1c during treatment with metformin. And these are the populations we are interested in most. 
Uh, first studies concentrated on the ph uh, pharmacokinetics of metformin because it is rather simple. Metformin is not metabolized in the body. It is excreted as it is uh, incorporated. So these studies uh, are limited to transport proteins. And here you see uh, metformin is taken up by the enterocyte in the gut via um, organic cation transporter 3, OCT3, and the enterocyte transporter 4. It is released from the enterocyte uh, and in the bloodstream via OCT1. It is taken up by the target cell, the hepatocyte, via OCT1 and OCT3. It's released via another transporter, a multidrug and uh, toxin extrusion protein 1 into the bile. But uh, most of metformin is excreted via the kidney. It is um, taken up into the renal tubular cell via OCT2 and this is excreted via three pathways in where OCT1, MATE1 and MATE2K are involved. So a uh, very promising candidate was organic cation transporter 1, where 23 coding variants were identified in this gene, and seven of them showed uh, significantly and ma markedly reduced transport activity in vitro. These are marked here with, with asterisk. And uh, what would be the consequences of this um, impaired transport, mainly the release into the bloodstream is blocked. Um, all other what is subsequent, uh, subsequently um, here, uh, the blockade of, of the uptake of metformin and hepatocytes and uh, the blockade of the transport, uh, the, the, um, the release into the urine are only of minor importance. But we should have an accumulation of metformin in enterocytes and probably also an increase in metformin concentration in the gut, probably uh, contributing to the side effects of the drug, gastrointestinal side effects such as diarrhea and uh, spasms, but also nausea and vomiting. And do we see this? Yes, there are studies in the South Danish uh, diabetes studies in 160 people, F uh, the, the more frequent mutations here, the five most frequent mutations were investigated and they indeed saw reduced plasma metformin levels as anticipated and uh, in consequence a limited treatment response with respect to HbA1c reduction upon therapy. In a much larger study, the Godard study, with 1,530 individuals, no effect was seen with respect to all these five mutations. This was astonishing. But they found that compound heterozygous carriers of these two mutations, arginine 61 cysteine and methionine 420 deletion, had a 2.4-fold higher risk of metformin intolerance. In an even more larger study, the matching consortium, um, no, e no effects were detected on uh, treatment response. So this was pretty disappointing. Therefore, the field uh, very quickly proceeded to pharmacogenomic investigations, investigating the whole genetic variability in the genome and the interference with treatment response. This was made available by the development of SNP arrays, where several hundred thousand SNPs in parallel could be tested. And uh, this was done in a meta-analysis of, of the Godard study, a Scottish observ uh, observational study, and the UK PDS. And they found a series of, of uh, polymorphisms around the ATM gene. This is ataxia, telangiectasia mutated gene, a checkpoint kinase in the cell cycle. And um, many of these SNPs are in linkage, in high uh, genetic linkage. And this picture also provides uh, the three problems of genomic studies. Because you test the whole genome, you have to correct your p-values for 10 million SNPs. This is the estimated number of, of, of polymorphisms in the genome. 
So you have to reach very, very low p-values, and this study did not reach this p-value, for example. Then, most variants we find are non-coding. We do not have really the, an idea what they do molecularly. And the, sec uh, the third problem is that most the mostly genes are identified with no described link to the disease, as is the case with ATM. Nevertheless, the SNP with the lowest p-value was shown to increase treatment response by 1.35-fold and enhances absolute HbA1c reduction by 0.11 HbA1c units per minor allele. And this was also replicated in a meta-analysis in the Dutch uh, in the Dutch study, Diabetes Care System Westfrisia, in the Rotterdam study, and um, a UK Atovastatin diabetes study, but they identified super responders, and this was not the primary aim. We are interested in the non-responders and, uh, and in the adverse responders I, I do not know what we do with this information that we identified super responders. This is nice to have. This is maybe of academic interest, but it's not of very uh, of interest for the for the practic for the practical therapy. Another finding was another hit was done by the Machin Consortium, who found by a genome-wide screen several polymorphisms around SLC2A2. This is the gene encoding glucose transporter 2. And they also had liver biopsies in 1, 000, from 1,200 uh, patients, and they found that indeed these SNPs increase GLUT2 expression. Very fine, very functional data, but again, this is an identification of super responders again. This, uh, the SNP with the lowest p-value enhances absolute HbA1c reduction by 0.08 HbA1c units per minor allele. It's up, uh, the effect size is somewhat lower of that compared to that of ATM. And this was replicated, but again, these are super responders. And uh, this, uh, this brings us to the question, is non-response and adverse re response to metformin therapy a result of lifestyle? or environmental factors. And there is one recent study by the working group of Charlotte Ling from the Lund University showing that a high BMI or high blood sugar levels lead to an increased DNA methylation of organic cation transporter genes and of mate genes. And you may know that an increased DNA methylation of genes is associated with reduced expression of these genes, and this can indeed affect pharmacokinetics of metformin. So, is this the end of metformin pharmacogenetics? To my opinion, yes. But it's not the end of pharmacogenetics in other treatment options. And in the following minutes, I will show you some pictures, some data, on the role of polymorphism in the TCF7L2 gene and its impact on the treatment with DPP4 inhibitors, and on the role of uh, polymorphism in the SLC5A2 gene, this encodes the SGLT2, the glucose transporter in the kidney. And with respect to another endpoint, I will tell you now. You know that SGLT2 is the major glucose transporter involved in renal glucose reabsorption in the proximal tubule. He is, uh, it is responsible for about 90% of reabsorption. The rest is reabsorbed by SGLT1. So that in a healthy subject, no glucose uh, is excreted in the urine. And this is uh, SGLT2 is also the target of the, uh, the glyphosins and inhibiting SGLT2 leads to uh, glucose excretion. About 70 gram per day are excreted. This corresponds to a loss of calories. About 280 kilocalories per day are lost. And the consequences are a reduction in blood glucose. This is the anti-diabetic effect, but also a reduction in blood pressure by osmotic diuresis and, of course, weight loss. 
And this is what we found with respect to this SNP in the SGLT2 gene. There is a, a SNP here that shows increased fasting glucose in our tubing and family study, also increased glucose during an oral glucose tolerance test, and increased systolic blood pressure. And this was also shown in a pool of four phase three studies from Böhringer Ingelheim and uh, Lilly, Germany. Um, here, this, this, the same SNP again had an increased, uh, it was associated with increased fasting glucose and increased systolic blood pressure. Does it have an impact on treatment? In this pool here, these were patients treated with empagliflozin for 24 weeks. There was no effect of this genotype on uh, the reduction in fasting glucose. There was no impact on weight loss but there was a very exciting increase in blood pressure. Usually the blood pressure decreases during treatment, but in this subgroup, we have a market increase. It's a nearly 10 millim millimeter mercury. Um, and this is, uh, of course, of clinical importance. This is only during 24 weeks. We do not know how the blood pressure rises over a year, two years, three years, and so on. And if we calculate that about 11.4% of drug-treated type 2 diabetic patients that are currently on SGLT2 inhibitors in Germany, and uh, the genotype AA has a frequency of 5%, then about 40,000 type 2 diabetic patients have, um, should show blood pressure increased during SGLT2 inhibitor treatment. The second example is uh, a TCF702. This SNP is the major type 2 diabetes risk SNP found to date. It was already identified prior to the genome-wide analysis, and it was uh, very quickly replicated by these genome-wide studies. And it plays a role in incretin-stimulated insulin secretion. Here in the upper part, you see the glucose-stimulated insulin secretion pathway. And in the lower part here, you see the incretin-stimulated insulin secretion pathways. You know that incretins are released by uh, intestinal cells, and they are degraded by DPP4. They bind to uh, specific receptors that are coupled to stimulatory G proteins. They activate adenylate cyclase, leading to an increase of intracellular cyclic AMP, protein kinase A activation, and downstream of protein kinase A is this transcription factor, TCF702. As a transcription factor, it controls the expression of genes, and it controls the expression of insulin, of prohormone convertase 1 and 2. These are two major uh, um, enzymes involved in the maturation of insulin, and the incretin receptors, CHIP receptor and GLP-1 receptor. So the incretin axis is the major target of GLP-1 receptor agonists and DPP-4 inhibitors. GLP-1 receptor agonists are incretin mimetics and directly bind and activate the incretin receptors, whereas DPP-4 inhibitors act indirectly. They inhibit DPP-4, the degrading enzymes, and thereby increase the endogenous levels of incretins. So in both stimulate via this pathway insulin secretion. So what happens to carriers of the TCF7L2 SNP? This is a non-coding variant, so it may have an effect on the expression of TCF7L2, and the reduced expression of this transcription factor will lead to a decreased expression of insulin, decreased expression of prohormone convertases and incretin receptors, and the decreased expression of incretin receptors will further uh, downregulate this pathway so that insulin secretion is expected to drop. And this is exactly what we see in our hyperglycemic clamp with incretin infusion. Here you see the effect in insulin secretion on hyperglycemia. It is compared to the incretin effect, very moderate. And uh, when we look at this incretin-stimulated insulin secretion, the carriers of the TCF7L2 SNP have a by 40% reduced insulin secretion. This is called incretin resistance. 
And does the SNP has an effect on treatment response? Yes, it has. Here's a, a study um, which was performed in collaboration with Böhringer Ingelheim. Here the treatment response to linagliptin, a DPP4 inhibitor, um, stratified according to the genotype in TCS7L2, and you see that the T T allele carriers, the minor allele carriers of the TCS7L2 SNP have indeed a significantly reduced treatment response. If we calculate again, that 27.6% of drug treated type 2 diabetes patients are currently on DPP4 inhibitors in Germany, and the TT genotype has a frequency of 16% in diabetic patients, then 330,000 type 2 diabetes patients should show a limited treatment response to DPP4 inhibitors. I think we can extrapolate this also to GLP-1 receptor agonists because tcf 7 2 is in the same pathway. So the number rises to 400,000 type 2 diabetic patients with limited treatment response. Still, this is a rather limited impairment of the treatment response. But we recently found a new transcription factor uh, located in this incretin signaling pathway, and this is NOR1. NOR1 in the beta cell is the product of the NR4A3 gene that is induced via the transcription factor CREP, and CREP is again downstream of protein kinase A, as is tcf 7 l 2 what happens when NOR1 is formed, it enters the nucleus again and regulates genes. And we found that, this, uh, that is, this is a new regulator of the insulin gene and of genes involved in the secretory pathway. So it, it is involved in insulin production and release. And one, what happens in carriers of this SNP here? This is also, again, a non-coding variant, and uh, the SNP uh, is expected to lead to a decreased expression of NOR1. This leads to a down-regulation of insulin expression and of the expression of uh, the genes involved in the secretory pathway, and this should lead to a, a reduction in insulin secretion. And this is exactly what we see. Here you see the effect of the NR4A3 a polymorphism, we see this reduction in, in insulin secretion, and uh, I want to point here out that uh, the risk allele here is the major allele, not the minor allele, and here you see the effect of the TCF7L2. Since both genes are in the incretin signaling pathway, we asked whether they interact, whether the polymorphisms interact. And therefore, we stratified this TCF7L2 uh, risk allele carriers into two groups according to the NR4A3 genotype. And indeed, the TTGG carriers have an even stronger reduction in insulin secretion as uh, the TT alone. <laughs> and this is also seen here. Uh, on the left hand, you see the effect of the risk allele on insulin secretion, as I to told you before. On the right hand, you even see the effect on the diabetes risk, as uh, we got in the, the EPIC Potsdam study. This is an epidemiological study with 690 incident type 2 diabetes cases. Here you see the effect of the TCF7L2 risk allele on diabetes risk. This is known. This is the strongest diabetes risk SNP. It, is, it increases diabetes risk by 37% per allele. And the risk allele in, in the NOR1 gene has no effect on diabetes risk, but having both risk alleles in TCF7L2 and NR4A3 increases diabetes risk even more beyond 1.5-fold. With this in mind, and uh, also having in mind this spread in the response of the TCF7L2 TT allele carriers, we suggest the carriers of both SNPs, the TCF7L2 SNP and the NR4A3 SNP, should be in this upper part of the spread of the response of these carriers. And this would be indeed a marked reduction in treatment response. So this is still a working hypothesis we are following up. And this would mean that uh, 
Given a, a frequency of TT and Chi Chi allele carriers of 7% that 175,000 di type 2 diabetic patients would have markedly limited treatment response. And this uh, we will show, ho I hope we will show this in the years to come. With this, I'm at the end of the talk and I will thank First of all, Hans Hering and Andreas Fritsche for giving me the opportunity or to get access to human study data. I thank Matthias Schulze for collaboration with epidemiological data and incident diabetes. I would like to thank Heike zimdahl gelling from Berlinger and Axel Hopp from Lille, Germany for the nice collaboration with this phase three trials. And um, my group, uh, particularly Anna-Maria Orlheide, who generated this no one data. Finally, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you for the excellent presentation with these uh, very, very interesting data. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. I would like to know about these studies you presented. Researchers investigated only the sites of actions, of action of drugs, or all enzymes involved in uh, glucose metabolism. Because maybe you know, it has been hypothesized that some key enzymes from mutations may be easier to metabolize glucose or faster or slower. Okay. Uh, the, first, the first focus was, of course, the genes involved in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, but of course, other enzymes involved in glucose metabolism could also interfere with this treatment response, but this has not yet been studied because the next step would maybe not be to to study these genes, but to, to bring this up at the whole genome level again, because we have the tools, we just need a consortium collecting all the studies to have uh, a sufficient um, statistical power to find genes general in general that interfere with treatment response, including the enzymes in glucose metabolism. We don't know yet, or we did not investigate? <laughs> This was not, not yet investigated. Other questions? Um, Professor Steiger, uh, you showed us many, 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 many data. And you point out to clinically relevant results or data. Uh, what is the reason to you, what is the reason that this data, this knowledge has not uh, been implemented yet in the clinical routine? Uh, is, it, is, it a, is it a, a, a matter of cost to, to, to uh, genotype all these, all these SNPs? Is it a matter of magnitude of the effect? Uh, what is the reason? The three reasons, replication, replication, replication. We need replication in other studies, in other ethnicities, and so on. This has really be verified, and we have to collect data on the function of the polymorphisms to understand the molecular background of this treatment response effects. How successful these data could be applied in everyday clinical practice? How much do you think? I think I think it's uh, it's no greater problem. The Mayo Clinic already implemented pharmacogenetics in the treatment with other drugs, not not on the diabetes field. They have implemented it in the in the health records of each patient that enters the clinic. Um, if you see this, uh, if you see, uh, uh, they, they collect genetic data from all patients. 
And if a patient has a certain genotype, um, he, he has he has to follow some some uh, <sighs> treatment treatment advices. So the Mayo Clinic is 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 uh, has proceeded very far with respect to pharmacogenetics, but not on the field of diabetes yet. And um, they have electronic electronic uh, patient. How, how how do you tell it? Electronic records patient records where they implement also the the genotype data whole genome genotype data where the, they can see uh, very fast um, the genetic variants that could be sorry that could be relevant for treatment of their disease of interest professor wetter um, can i ask one more question. What, what is more relevant, the genotype or the phenotype of the person? For example, if I know I have a mutation that will cause me side effects on metformin treatment, but I still can tolerate the drug, what, what should be the, the decision? Genotyping and then not giving me the treatment, or, um, or should we... Uh, just closer investigate the patients if they have side effect or effects or non-response to of, the treatment. Of, of course, all of this, not only the genotype, but, of the, but also the phenotype and the epigenotype and the, all data so should be integrated. And this will be the future, I think. So the genotype will give us a hint yes. to look at a non-response, yes. but then the non-response will be evaluated. Yes. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>